All right, this is one of my most favorite physics problems in the world. The reason why it's first of all important is because I think it's important for everyone to know that on, on the MCAT, there will be physics with math, but um, more importantly, it will be conceptual physics that you'll be testing on because you don't really get a calculator. And so even if you have to do math, it'll be with easy numbers. But sometimes the hardest questions are ones like these where you really have to think about the principle. Okay, today I'm going to give you one of those examples. So it says there is a boat floating in a pool of water. So you can assume there's a pool. Um, and on the boat, there's a rock. And at time t1, the boat and rock are floating and the water level of the pool is marked. So, you know, if you're, if you're like me and you want to visualize it, there's, there's time t1. This whole, uh, this whole picture right here is time t1. Uh, and on that on that um, time period, we're going to mark the water level of the pool. And the water level of the pool is right here. Now take, take this into consideration because at time point T2, the rock is thrown off the boat and into the pool. So you'll see that the rock is thrown off the boat and into the pool at time T2. Uh, what will happen to the water level of the pool? Will the water level of the pool sink, as is denoted by A? Will the water level rise, as is denoted by B? Uh, or will water levels stay the same? Or none of the above. If you don't think you have enough information to answer this question, you can always answer D. So how, how are we going to approach this? So let's go ahead and get started. Um, there are two main principles here. One is called Archimedes' principle. And, you know, you may have already heard the story of Archimedes where he, he um, went into a tub full of water saw that when you go into water, a tub full of water, you move some of the water out of the way. As you get into the pool, you move some of the stuff out of the way. And the water level will increase as you step into a tub of water. And that water level increases because you displace water. So Archimedes had this revelation saying that, okay, when you go into water, the buoyant force on an object is equal to the weight of displaced fluid and you might not think you might think this is a bunch of words but let me tell you what this means uh, if you were to go into a tub filled with water or even if you go in to um, the ocean you displace a certain amount of fluid and when you displace that fluid that fluid weight is ultimately what's holding you up okay water literally moves out of the way when you enter uh, into water for any object and so this buoyant force is taking place anytime you're in the water. So the formula for buoyant force is equal to the weight of the displaced fluid. How are we going to find the weight of the displaced fluid? Well, obviously the weight of the displaced fluid, first of all, what you can do is you can, you can figure out the density of the fluid that you're in. So in our case, it's usually water, but you just figure out the density. And then you want to multiply that by the volume of the fluid displaced okay um, and this is important it's not just the total volume of the fluid it's gonna be the volume of the fluid displaced you might be wondering how to find out what that is and I'll tell you how but wait one second but remember if you multiply density times volume you just get mass right this would just give you mass and last but not least to make this into an actual force we have to multiply it by the gravitational con not the gravitational constant just the acceleration due to gravity um, because that's um, going to turn this into an actual force, okay? Um, and more importantly, it's going to turn it into the weight. Remember, weight is mg. Um, and so when you multiply all of this, you're going to get the weight of the displaced fluid, all right? Um, now, how you find the volume of the fluid that's displaced? Well, the volume of the fluid that's displaced is essentially just equal to the volume of the object immersed in the water. Because think about it, if you put your hand into the water, the amount of volume of water that you're going to move out of the way is equal to the volume of your hand, because now whatever water was there is being used up by your hand. Uh, similarly, when you have this boat, right, we're going to get to it, when, but when we have this boat, the volume of the water that's being displaced is equal to the volume of the boat. So let's go ahead to go to this next one. So when the rock is on the boat, I'm going to draw a free body diagram for the rock and the boat. So remember, anytime you do this, you want to make sure you understand the free body diagram. Okay, so for the rock, 
for the rock plus boat. Okay, and the free body diagram is obviously going to be anything that's sitting in the water has a certain amount of mass, uh, certain amount of weight that's pulling it down because of gravity, right? And so that's going to be the mass of the rock plus the boat times g, right? That's just the normal weight. But this boat is floating, and that means that the buoyant force in the opposite direction has to be equal but opposite in magnitude to this weight of the boat. And so this is what I'm going to call f of... I'm going to call this f of b1, okay? Remember the numbers. Because this is just going to be the buoyant force acting on both the boat and the water, boat and the rock when they're floating, okay? And the rock is inside of the um, boat. Now, more importantly, what does this mean? Well, it just means what is B1? The force of the buoyant force has to be equal to the mass of the rock plus the boat times G. Remember, I said F of B1 has to equal the weight of the boat. And the weight of the boat plus rock is right here. So F of B has to be equal in magnitude to the mass of the rock plus the boat. And what did we say that the buoyant force was equal to? Well, we said the buoyant force was equal to, in this case, the density of water times, times the volume of whatever is immersed, right? Volume of whatever is immersed. So I'm just going to call that V1 times G, right? So in this case, I haven't defined V1 yet, but it's just an abstract quantity. I just wanted you to see the relationship between the buoyant force to the mass of the rock in the boat to the overall volume immersed, okay? This is an important thing we will need to remember moving forward to answer this question, all right? And I'm just going to try to make it a bit cleaner here, okay? So make sure we remember this. So in this case, when the rock is on the board, the, the buoyant force is equal to the mass of the rock t plus the boat times g, which is equal to the density of water times v1, which we don't know yet, times g. Because we don't actually need any numbers. We want to understand the theory. Okay, now, when the rock is thrown off the boat, now we have to make two separate free body diagrams. So the boat free body diagram I'm going to draw here, and the rock free body diagram I'm going to draw here. When the boat is, when the rock is off the boat, the boat is still going to float, right? So now I'm going to draw this thing going down, which is going to be the mass of the boat times g. So the boat will have its own weight. But the boat is still going to be floating. So now we're going to have to add in this new thing, which I'm going to call f of b2. So f of b2 is just the buoyant force acting on the boat. All right. Now the rock, on the other hand, the rock has its own mass, right? But now the rock is accelerating downwards. It's actually going into the water. It's If you ever throw a rock into a water, especially a huge rock, you're going to notice it sinks right away. And when it sinks, the mass of the rock significantly is higher than the buoyant force because that's the way it has to be. So I'm going to label that F of B3 because if it was not true, then the rock would not sink to the bottom. But in this case, it will because it's massive. So the buoyant force acting on the rock, which I'm calling F of B3, has to be less than the mass of the rock times gravity. Okay, so let's make sure we understand that. Ultimately, F of B3 has to be less than mass of the rock times G, right? And now the and other thing I'm going to say is, in this case, the boat's still floating, right? So F of B2 has to be equal to the mass of the boat times the gravitational, I mean, the, the acceleration due to gravity. So now, now I want, I want to compare this. If I add up F of B2 plus F of B3, that's going to give me the total volume of um, water displaced. That's going to give me the total amount of water displaced in this instance, right? It's going to give me the water displaced. at t2, right? This is t2. On the other hand, I want to compare this to f of b1, which is water, which is an indirect representation of the water 
displaced at t1. So now let's compare the two. If I were to compare the two, you'll notice that f of b1 and is equal to m of a rock plus the mass of the, the boat times g, right? f of b1, I'm going to do this like right over here, this last section of math. f of b1 is equal to the mass of the rock times the mass of the boat times g, right? On the other hand, we know f of b2 is equal to mass of the boat times g. And we also know f of b3 is equal is less than mass of the rock times the gravitational constant. So if you take all of this into consideration, the mass of the rock plus the boat times the gravitational constant is f of b1, f of b2 is mass of the boat times the rock, and f of b3 is mass of rock times g, then when you add f of b2 plus f of b3, it has to be less than f of b1. That's the only way this inequality would work, because f of b2 is equal to one part of f of b1, but f of b3 is clearly less than the other part of f of b1, right? So if we make sense of this, if we understand that f of b1 is ultimately greater than f of b2 plus f of b3, then the thing you can say is this is the buoyant force. Is that how you spell buoyant? Yes. This is the buoyant force at t2, right? On the other hand, this is the buoyant force at t1. And because the buoyant force is indirect representation of the water displaced, right? Because it's an indirect representation of the water displaced, the um, water displaced at t1 is greater than the water displaced at t2. So what exactly am I trying to say here? Well, what I'm trying to say is this is what we have at t1, right? And at t1, when we have the water, when we have the rock on the boat, we displace more water than at t2, which could be represented by either of these situations. We don't know yet. But let's say in t1, we displace 100 mils of water, okay? Let's say we started with the baseline here, and then when we added the rock onto the boat, we displaced 100 mils. Okay, that's how much we displace because we displaced that much water. At T2, however, remember, our baseline is still going to be the same. So at T2, whatever happens, we're still going to start with this. Okay, but now we're going to displace less water. In this case, we're going to displace something that's less than 100 mils. So we might only displace, in this case, something like 70 mils. Because remember, the water displaced at time 2 is less than the water displaced at time 1. And for that level, and for that reason, what you ultimately see is that the water sinks. That's what you observe. And we just went through all of it conceptually. We talked about the fact that the buoyant force on this instance at T1, the buoyant force is greater than the total buoyant force. Remember, the buoyant force here is F of b2 and the buoyant force here is f of b3 and we talked about how f of b2 and f of b3 is less than overall here which is f of b1 and we proved that and together this ultimately shows us that the water displaced at t2 is less than the water displaced at t1 and therefore if we actually go back let's see if we can go back ooh, wrong if we actually go back to the first page, the answer to this question is that the water will actually decrease in level. And because the water decreases in level, the answer here is B.
hope you guys enjoyed the video. This is definitely one of the most challenging conceptual things to get in your head, but I genuinely do think once you get it, it'll really help. All right, see you guys in the next one.